أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم محمد عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وسلم As you just heard, Ikhwani, the topic that I've been assigned is the topic of the issue dealing with drugs and drinking alcohol, as well as gambling, specifically dice. And in dealing with this issue, the first thing that I want to make clear is that these vices are from the most lethal and the most effective tools of a shaitan. And as a result of that, it was only sensible that the religion of Al-Islam addressed the issue head on, just as we're trying to address the issue here in this masjid. In many of the masajid that are traditional and that are cultural, you got people who are dealing with drugs and having other kind of problems with all kinds of vices, and you don't hear any instruction coming from the member, or those issues are not being tackled with, or dealt with at all. There's something that we don't want to be the way of our masjid here at uh, Green Lane Masjid, because that shouldn't be the case with any masjid. So in dealing with this issue, we should bring to your attention that in the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there is something that is known as the Dururiyat al-Khamsa, the five essential things that Al-Islam came to take care of and it came to protect. Al-Islam came to protect Ikhwani, the religion of the people. And Al-Islam came to protect the lives of the people. And it came to protect the money and the wealth of the people. And it came to protect the lineage of the people. And it came to protect the honor of the people. Those are the five dururiyat. Some of the ulama add on to it a sixth one, and that is that it came to protect the intellect of the people. So when we look at the haram and the halal in al-Islam, all of the halal and the haram issues, they come to take care of these five or six things. Drugs and alcohol, they pose a threat to all six of them, showing the seriousness, seriousness of the issue. They pose a threat to all six of them. The individual who murders, he commits the major crime of murdering someone. He may murder an individual, but it really doesn't necessarily harm his lineage. It doesn't harm his lineage at all. A person may be a practitioner of magic, a major sin but it doesn't necessarily harm his lineage at all. It may not harm his money at all. But the issue of alcohol and drugs, it affects every single one of these six issues that Al-Islam came to deal with, came to protect. And as such, as you're going to see, it is a serious issue in the religion. And the way that it was dealt with in the Quran and the Sunnah is in a serious manner. Before going on, I just want to try to clear something in terms of trying to explain, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he prophesied about a phenomenon that was going to happen and it is happening now, it's been happening for some time concerning alcohol and concerning drugs. And there's no way in the world he could have known about these issues over 1400 years ago without Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala revealing these things to him. He said Sallallahu Alaihi wa ala Alaihi Wasallam they are going to come a group of people from my ummah. They're not kufar. They're from my ummah. They will try to make intoxicants halal. They're going to call intoxicants by other than the proper name. They won't call it khamr. They won't call it alcohol. They'll give other names to it. And they think by changing the name of the thing, then it changes the essence of the thing or the ruling of the particular thing. Because of this hadith, we have to deal with identifying what is an alcoholic beverage in this religion and what's the difference between alcohol and narcotics. Because I remember when I came into the deen, 
in 1986, there were people who, like me, reverted to Al-Islam, converted to Al-Islam, and they used to smoke marijuana, they used to smoke cannabis. And they used to try to get us to believe that cannabis was from the earth and is natural. And as a result of that, it hasn't been made haram because it's from the earth. And we still hear people saying that today. The Messenger of Allah made it clear to us, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, what is an alcoholic beverage. There was a man who came from Al Yemen and they had a name for alcohol there. There was a beverage called Al Mizru, Al Mizru, Al Mizru. That was one of the names of the alcoholic beverages. And it used to make people intoxicated and drunk. The man asked the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Ya Rasulullah, is this Mizru, is it haram? The Messenger of Allah asked that man, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Awa muskirun huwa? Does it intoxicate you? Does it make you drunk? Does it have the ability and the quality of making a person intoxicated? The man said, yes. He told the man, Sallallahu Alaihi wa ala Ali wa Sallam, Kullu muskirin haram. Everything that makes you drunk. Everything that makes you intoxicated, it is haram. Everything. This hadith first proves something that we always say when we come across hadith like this. First, it goes to show the Prophet did not have knowledge of everything, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He had to inquire from the man. Does that thing, that intoxicant, that beverage, does it make you drunk? The man said, yes. If he knew the ilm al-ghayb, he wouldn't have never asked the question because he knows every word. The second thing is that although in the city of al Medina where the Prophet lived, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and they didn't know what that beverage was, he didn't know what it was, the fact that he didn't know the name of that specific beverage doesn't mean that it has a name that you don't know. So therefore, it's not haram in al-Islam. It is the quality of intoxication that makes the issue haram no matter what you call it. Another group of people came to him and they asked him about an intoxicant that was called al-bit'u. He asked them the same question. Does it get you high? Does it make you drunk? They say yes. He said, then it is something that is haram. In another authentic hadith, the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam made it clear for us in regards to the liquid alcohol, the liquid alcohol, what it comes from and what does it constitute. He said, Sallallahu Alaihi wa ala alihi wa sallam, inna min al ainab khamra, wa inna min al tamr khamra, wa inna min al asl khamra, wa inna min al burri khamra, he said alcohol comes from these five things they come from grapes and they also come from dates and they come from it comes from honey you ferment these things and they produce alcohol alcohol also comes from barley and it comes from wheat he mentioned that because that's what the people knew at that time alcohol also comes from corn Alcohol also comes from vinegar. Alcohol is also manufactured during these days, and it's not mentioned in none of these hadith, but the people have the ability to manufacture and create alcohol. But because the name doesn't come in the Quran and the Sunnah, no one can come and say, this is not mentioned in the Quran and the Sunnah because of that, it is not haram. The definitive characteristic that makes it haram is the fact that it makes you drunk. It makes you intoxicated. That's as it relates to the liquid alcohol. As for drugs, it takes the same ruling. It takes the same ruling as alcoholic beverages because they intoxicate you. And Umar radiallahu anhu, he gave us a comprehensive, prevailing definition of alcohol and drugs. He says, radiallahu anhu, al-khamru ma khamr al-aql. Khamr, intoxicants, is that thing which causes the mind to be closed or concealed. Anything that causes you to lose your faculties, it makes you intoxicant. Whether it's liquid, whether it's a powder, whether it's a pill, that thing is considered to be khamr. The Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and that's where Umar got this definition from, the authentic hadith. He told the people, Sallallahu Alaihi wa ala Alaihi Wasallam, Kullu muskir khamr. Haram. Everything that gets you drunk is khamr. Based upon that prophetic definition. 
the drugs that the people use today, the narcotics that they use today, the word khamr can be attached to all of them because they make a person intoxicated. Next point I want to mention in the way of an introduction is concerning the amount because the scholars of Al-Islam in this issue of Al-Khamr a lot of the feet of our ulama of the past slipped. We're going to come to a critical point concerning that, insha'Allah. People who are far greater than all of us, their feet slipped in regard to this issue of khamr. And in their slipping is a lesson for us and hikmah from a number of angles. In regards to the amount, the Messenger of Allah وسلم, told us, he told his companions, and hakum an khalil. I prohibit on you people a small amount of whatever a large amount of it causes you to be drunk. So if there is a large amount of it and you were to drink a gallon of it, then drinking just a small portion of it that may not get you drunk. I made that small portion haram. If a lot of it, consuming a lot of it will get you intoxicated, then a small amount of it is haram. So the person who gets a so-called non-alcoholic beer that only has 0.1% alcohol, based upon this hadith, that is haram. If you're going to drink beer that has barley and wheat or whatever, it has to be 0.00%. If it has 1%, it's haram, based upon that hadith. Prophet says, sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam, مَا أَسْكَرَ مِنْهُ الْفَرَقَ فَمِلْءُ كَفَّيْهِ أو مِلْءُ كَفِّهِ مِنْهُ حَرَامٍ Anything that, let's say, is a gallon. Al-Faraq was a size of a container that the Arabs used to use. Let's say, for the sake of argument, it's a gallon. He said any liquid that has a gallon is filled up and is a, gallons in, a gallon in weight. If that makes you drunk, then taking two hands to drink it like that, just that small portion, then that is also haram. Now I want to make a point here about our ulama. We have not ceased to hear an amazing statement and an amazing piece of advice from people who are speaking. People who want to keep the ummah uneducated and backwards. I have nothing against the madhahib in al-Islam. As we mentioned so many times, the madhabs are systematic ways of learning our religion. But there are those people who insist on telling us that you have to have a madhab. And if you don't have a madhab, then there's something wrong with your Islam. They never present to us any ayat of the Quran to prove that. They never present to us any hadith where the Prophet said that. So there are two extremes with these madhabs. One extreme is the one who says, everyone here, if you don't have a madhab, you're practicing Islam incorrectly and you're sinning. The other extreme are the people who say the madhabs are innovations and it's haram to have a madhab. There's a great scholar of Islam who was of that opinion. We respect him and we ask Allah to reward him for his ijtihad. Now let me show you one of the clear issues that show you don't have to have a madhab. And you shouldn't tell people that they have to have a madhab. And the issue of drinking khamr the madhabs made some serious mistakes. The madhab that is prevalent from where we come from, the madhab that started in Al Kufa, and the main scholar of this madhab was in Al Kufa. They were of the opinion that it is permissible to drink anything made out of khamr except grapes. That was the position of the major scholar of that madhab of Al Kufa, where most of us come from in our country on that madhab. His opinion was. What's haram from khamar is the grapes. As for khamar that comes from barley, khamar that comes from vinegar, khamar that comes from dates and other than that, then if you can drink it and not get drunk, then it's not haram. If you can drink one glass and not become intoxicated, it's not haram. But if you drink a second glass and a third glass, and then the fourth glass makes you drunk, then that fourth glass is what is haram. That is well known in that madhat. Now, if someone came and they said, you have to have a madhab, he's telling the person, you have to take this position here. You have to take this position of allowing people to drink khamr. He's going to make a drink that's not from grapes, which that imam felt was haram. 
everything else. You can drink a glass of it. You just can't drink to the point where you become drunk. No, I say follow that medhab if that's what you want to do. But when you come to a ruling like this, then you have to obey the Prophet ﷺ who said, if a gallon of the thing makes you intoxicate, intoxicated, then a handful like this is haram. What a lot of it makes you intoxicated, then a little bit of it is haram. That's for every single medhab. And there are serious issues with every medhab. I don't want to digress, but this is a critical issue. An issue that keeps the Muslims preoccupied with those things that are of lesser importance. Tell the people they have to have a medhab. Then don't blame your daughter if she goes and she gets married without a wali. Because that was the position of the medhab. So every medhab gets it right, every medhab gets it wrong. But in this issue of khamr, there's no room to play around. The medhab allows you to drink an, a, allows you to drink a bottle of beer, a regular bottle of Heineken. It would allow you to drink that as long as you don't get drunk. That's in the medhab because it's not made from the grapes. And the Imam al-Bukhari, rahimahullah ta'ala, brought a number of hadith to refute this position and this position of that particular medhab. We go to the next point, and the next point is to show ikhwani. Ikh the seriousness of khamr and drugs in the religion of al-Islam. There's a scholar who's a relatively recent scholar. He died about 80 years ago or less than that, maybe 60, 70 years ago. His name is Muhammad Rashid Rada, rahimahullah ta'ala. He has a contemporary tafsir called Tafsir al-Manar. He brought a bath or some statements about this issue of khamr when he came to the ayat in Surah al-Baqarah. And he said, if you were to gather up all of the ayat that make khamar haram and all of the ahadith that make khamar haram and describe khamar, you will find that the way the religion addresses the prohibition of khamar is unlike and unparalleled to anything else in the religion. That the way the religion addresses khamar is more severe than the way it addressed a shirk, a zina, gambling and even murder to the point that some of the companions like Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anhuma he was of the opinion based upon the statement of the Prophet sallallahu al-khamr akbar al-kabair the Prophet said that khamr is the biggest sin Abdullah ibn Abbas said after a shirk the worst sin that a person can fall into is al-khamr drinking intoxicants now look how al-islam dealt with this issue to leave no doubt in the mind of the intelligent person about the seriousness of khamr. The first thing in showing the seriousness of doing drugs and drinking is that Allah Ta'ala in the Quran, He has put khamr together in the Quran and the Prophet did the same thing in the authentic sunnah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He put it together with a shirk and kufr and made it parallel and equal and described it as even being greater in certain circumstances. In the Quran, Allah Ta'ala said, Ya ayyuhu alladheena amanu, innama al-khamr wal-maysir wal-ansabu wal-azlam rijsum min amil shaytan fajtanibuhu l'allakum tuflihun. O you who believe, verily intoxicants and gambling and slaughtering food for the idols as well as divination with arrows. You want to make a decision? Instead of making Salat al-Istikhara, the non-Muslims of Quraysh, they used to get arrows and they would pull out arrows to decide what to do. If the long arrow came, they would do it. If the short arrow came, they wouldn't do it and so forth and so on. Allah Ta'ala mentioned this practice of the Mushrikeen of Quraysh. And he coupled these two issues. What Quraysh used to do, they used to slaughter for the idol, Al-Ansab. And they used to do divination for arrows. Allah Azawajal mentioned khamr and gambling and he made them equal to these th they were mentioned zina wasn't mentioned there murder wasn't mentioned there neither one of those two great sins magic wasn't mentioned there the issue of khamr and gambling was mentioned there the prophet وسلم, told the people man mata wa fi batnihi khamrun mata mita jahiliya anyone who dies and intoxicants are in his stomach when he dies he has died the death of Jahiliyyah. Jahiliyyah is the pre-Islamic period. The period in which the people didn't believe in Allah. 
So anyone who dies and he has khamar in his stomach, he dies like the people of Jahiliya, the people with no deen. He said in another hadith, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, mutmin al-khamr, mutmin al-khamr, in mata, laqi Allah ka'abid wathan, the one who is addicted to drinking. He's addicted to drugs and he's addicted to drinking. If he dies in that state, he's going to meet Allah the same way a person who worship idols meets Allah. Abu Lahab and Abu Jahl, they didn't believe in Allah. They were people from Al-Jahiliyyah and they took the religion of the people of Al-Jahiliyyah. They worship idols. When they die or they dead, when they meet Allah Azawajal, they're going to meet him and because of their shirk and kufr, they're going to have to deal with that. The one who is addicted to alcohol will meet Allah the same way. Another hadith said, if he died and he was addicted to khamar, he is going to meet Allah like the people who worship Allah and Al-Uzza, two of the main guys of Quraysh. So the point here is, no one should be in any doubt when we find the ayat making khamar and gambling side by side with these practices that Quraysh used to do, which were from the issues of his shirk and kufr. No one should be in doubt about the seriousness of al-khamr when the Prophet ﷺ described the person who dies and he was addicted to alcohol or addicted to drugs. He's going to stand before Allah and he's going to be like the one who worship the idols. But I have to make this point very clear. That doesn't mean that the person who drinks khamr is a kafir. It doesn't mean that. These hadith are understood that the person who knows khamr is haram but he tries to make it halal. He makes istihlal. And then after making halal what Allah made haram, then this person becomes a non-Muslim and he's the one who this, these hadith are referring to and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. That's the first point of how the serious way that Islam looked at drugs and how Islam looked at the issue of intoxicants. Another way is that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi Wa ala alihi wa sallam, he informed the people in many, many ahadith, and Allah has mentioned in many, many ayat that it is wajib upon us when we eat from what he has produced for us in the earth and we drink from what has been provided for us by Allah in the earth, we have to eat and drink from those things that are halal and those things that are from the tayyibat. Many, many ayat say that. Many, many ayat. From them, the statement of Allah Ta'ala, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu kulu min tayyibati ma razaqnaakum. O you who believe, eat from the good things that we have provided you with. Allah mentioned in another ayat, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu kulu mimma fil ardi halalin tayyiba. O you believe, eat from what is in the earth and it is halal and it is wholesome, it's pure, it's good. And for that reason, it's haram and from the major sins for someone to come and to make haram those things that Allah made halal for the people. We have to be careful about saying things like Pepsi is haram, Coca-Cola is haram, Mountain Dew is haram. Why is it haram? Because it's a Jewish company or they support Zionism and therefore it's haram. You cannot make haram upon the people the good things that Allah Azawajal has provided them with. This is from the big sins in Islam. In the Torah and the Injil, Allah described the Prophet to those people, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and He said about him in the Torah and in the Injil, and it's mentioned in the Quran, "Alladina yatabiuna Rasul al-Nabi al-Ummi, alladhi yajidunu maktuban fi Torati wal Injil, yamurhum bin Maruf, yanhaum man al-Munkar, wa yuhillu lhum al-Tayyibat, wa yuharim alaihim al-Khabaith." Those people who follow the messenger, the prophet who was unlettered, the one who they found written and mentioned in the Torah and the Injil with these descriptions. He's going to enjoin the good upon them and he's going to prevent them from doing the munkar, the evil. And he makes halal for them the good things and he makes haram for them the khaba'ith. So the khaba'ith are those dirty, filthy things like khinzir, like eating snakes, like eating cats, like eating defecation, the waste that come out of human beings. Those are from the khaba'ith that are haram in this religion. 
any nasty thing, khabith, you can think about, the Prophet said about it, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, al-khamru umul khabaith, man sharibaha, man sharibaha, taraka salat, wa waqa'a, ala ummihi wa khalatihi wa ammatihi. Think of any nasty, dirty thing, filthy thing that you can think about consuming. He said that khamr is the mother of all dirty, filthy things. It's the mother of it all. If a man drinks it, if a person drinks it, he is going to abandon the salat, and he's also going to have relations with his mother. He'll have relations with his maternal auntie. He'll have relations with his, matern with his paternal auntie as a result of khamr. As Umar said, may Allah be pleased with him. Khamr is that thing that will cause the mind to be covered. The man drinks khamr, and as a result of consuming drugs, narcotics, khamur, as a result of that, you'll find him doing things that are atrocities in the religion and outside of the religion of Al-Islam. The meaning of having relations with his mother and his aunties is not only having relations. Another meaning of that, and we've experienced that in this masjid. The hadith said, وَقَعَ عَلَىٰ أُمِّهِ وَخَالَتِهِ وَعَمَّتِهِ He will fall on his mother and his two maternal, his maternal and paternal aunties. We know people who do drugs. And as a result of doing drugs, the man steals from his mother. He stole her gold in order to take care of the habit that he has. He has a habit of using her on. As a result of that, there's no hurma with his mother. He goes and he steals his mother's gold, his auntie's gold. On the day of the aid and other than the aid, you can't allow him in the house. Because if you have guests in the house who don't know that he has a drug problem, he'll take advantage of the fact that the lady, she put her bag down. The auntie, the relative, the, just the neighbor, put the bag down. He'll come in and he'll steal or she'll steal from their property. That's the reality of intoxicants and the reality of the narcotics that people take. So the Prophet wasallam addressed the issue that people can relate to back then and they can relate to it right now. So the khamr is the mother of all dirty things, filthy things. In addition to that, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam, he explained that the khamr is the mother of all of the fahisha as well. The first hadith said, the khamr is the ummu al khabaif the mother of all filthy things. It's the greatest, filthiest thing. This hadith said, Al-Khamru Umul Fawahish. Khamr is the mother of all fahisha. It's the big thing that causes people to fall into Al-Fahisha. And then he said, similar to the previous hadith, Man sharibaha waqa'ala ummihi wa khalatihi wa ammatihi. Anyone who drinks it, the person who drinks it, he may have relationships with his mother, his paternal auntie, and his maternal auntie. For this reason, from the proofs that the ulama use to show that khamar is haram, is the ayat in Surah Al-A'raf, قُلْ إِنَّمَا حَرَّمَ رَبِّيَ الْفَوَاحِشِ مَا ظَهَرَ مِنْهَا وَمَا بَطَنِ Because the Prophet says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, khamar is the mother of all of the fahisha. If a person drinks khamar, the door is going to be open for other things that he's going to partake in. From the ways that Al-Islam addressed the issue of al-khamr. That the Prophet described the khamr sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as being the key that opens up all of the doors of evil. He told our community, لا تشربوا الخمر فإنها مفتاح كل شر. Do not drink khamr because it is the key of all evils. Two weeks ago, Ikhwani, on the TV, there's a program called Question Time one of the more intelligent programs that come on TV. Two weeks ago, not last Thursday, two weeks ago, one of the questions that they put forth towards the panel and the audience was, is the UK a broken society? Is this society broken? This society where they encourage young people to indulge in binge drinking, drinking is a part of the society. So most of the audience said, it's a broken society. The panel, some said yes, some said no. But I want you to consider this. Living in this country, look what happens in this society and look at the role of Khamr. You all heard of the problem that recently happened with the two young kids, the two brothers, 
who sodomized and molested another young kid took a picture of it with their telephone and they were sentenced recently. Both of them experienced drinking khamar. Both of them were children who were born to parents who were drinking while they were in the mother's womb. The mother drank and the father, both of them were habitual users of drugs and khamar. Look at the result of the kids. The kids are victims. The kids are a tragedy, like other tragedies that transpire. Is it a broken society? You heard, like I heard, about baby P. The little baby who his mother's boyfriend broke the baby's back and broke a number of bones inside of the little kid's body. Not one bone, two bones, 10 bones, 12 bones, over 30 bones in the boy's body. Why? The boyfriend of the mother who was with the child used to take khamar and used to do drugs. You heard, like I heard recently, the man, he was drunk and on drugs. He went and he raped an 80-year-old woman, raped her, 80 years old. They asked him, why did you do that? The man was on drugs and he was drunk, a broken society. Those are the direct results of khamar in London, in London, two kids. They have vicious dogs, attack dogs. They live on an estate. For those of you who don't know, the estate is the place where poor people live. You don't pay rent. You live there for free. You're on the dole. They were protecting their estate with two vicious dogs. Two strangers, young kids, 116, 117, came on the estate. And while they were patrolling, they caused their two dogs to go and to moil, moil them. They mowed them down, ate them up, bit them up. After that, got the dogs off of him and stabbed both of the boys. One nine times, one twelve times. One of them died, the other one didn't die. When they looked into the situation, they were drinking khamar and they were getting high during the course of the day. And there are so many examples of this issue. The Prophet wasn't lying when he said, Sallallahu Alaihi wa ala Ali wa sallam, khamar is the key of all evil. It's the key to shirk, it's the key to kufr. Is the key to magic, is the key to rape, is the key to lying, is the key to stealing. Khamr is the key of all evil. He didn't say that, sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam, about other aspects of the religion. So when we look in this society and the people who are sociologists and they're trying to deal with the issue, all of the strain and the problems that drinking and drugs put on the NHS, on the penal system, the amount of people were in prison and they were in jail because of drinking and drugs, it cost the people a lot of money in our money that we pay for taxes. And other than that, you have a business, now Muslims work for you, or a Muslim who does drugs and he drinks. How much money do they lose as a result of people going out, partying and drinking and not being able to come in the next day? We went. When those shiuch came to Luton, when they were checking the sheikhs into the hotel, one of the ladies, she looked like she didn't want to serve us. The sheikh clocked on to the situation and he said, what's wrong with her? Doesn't she know that in this country they say that the customer is always right? Why is she acting so unprofessional? I took it as an opportunity to say to the, sis, to the lady to see what the deal is. Maybe she's a racist. I say, you know, this man is from out of this country. He said that you don't look like you want us to stay in a hotel. She said, no, I'm sorry, but I've been drinking all night. It was New Year's Eve yesterday, and this is my situation right now. The manager heard that. The manager didn't mind because he was so happy she was the only one who came in. The other people didn't come in because they lose a lot of money just because people calling and saying we're not coming in because we have hangovers. In the religion of Al-Islam, from the top to the bottom, the Quran and the Sunnah deals with the issue of showing us Khamar is from those issues that cause a lot of problems, cause a lot of problems. From what shows us the seriousness and the severity of intoxicants and drugs simultaneously, is that the Prophet in the Allah in that ayat that we mentioned, he said that Khamar was from the actions of a shaitan. It's from the actions of a shaitan. In the next ayah he said, إِنَّمَا يُرِيدُ shaytanu." And Shaitan, he wants to create between you people, the Muslims. He wants to create 
enmity and hatred between you based upon you using khamr and based upon you gambling. Now look at what the Prophet wasallam showed us and look what our religion says. And we can say alhamdulillah. For the most part, you can rest assured and you can safely assume when you're addressing a Muslim community like this, even if it wasn't in this masjid, if it was in a private local hall, you can safely assume that the vast majority of Muslims don't drink intoxicants and they don't get high. But it brings me to this other issue. In starting off this talk, we mentioned to you that khamr is not only what comes in the liquid form, and khamr is not only from those five things that the Prophet mentioned, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, but khamr is also marijuana, it's cocaine, it's heroin, and khamr is also something that's prevalent in our community in Birmingham, and that is khat. Khat is from the khamur in our religion that is not permissible because it makes people drunk. Not drunk like drinking vodka, not like that, but it impacts on the person. Look at this issue of this ayat. Verily, shaitan, he wants to create between you hatred and enmity and animosity. He wants to make you people be at each other's necks and against each other because of khamr and because of gambling. I say to the young brothers right now, as we mentioned in the khutbah on the first of this Gregorian calendar's new year, that it's very difficult with this hip-hop culture that you have to deal with in the hip-hop culture. It encourages people to drink and to get high. That's part of the culture. And also gambling. So if anyone has had the opportunity to see any of those videos, those videos are always showing khamar, marijuana, and gambling, throwing dice all the time. It's part of the culture. And look what happens. Look what happens. And look what has happened. Because these people have desensitized us as Muslims in buying into this culture of the gang life and being people who drink and thugs and on and on to the point that we say things that are not even permissible. Everyone knows in El Islam, everyone knows that the dog is a nasty character in our religion. And if a person has a dog, he has to have it for a religious reason. Many of our youth who do drugs and they brought into this type of culture, the hip-hop culture, they have dogs. People who drink, people who smoke, not all of them, but many of them who buy into that culture, they have dogs. Not only that, but they use the word dog as a term of endearment. I want to show and signify that this is one of my best friends. I'll say, yeah, I know him. That's my dog. That's my dog. And I don't mind saying it, and he doesn't mind it being said. As an African-American, one of the worst things you can call me 15, 20 years ago was to call me a nigger. That was one of the worst things that you can call a black person back then. The hip-hop culture has desensitized us to the point where the Pakistani young boy is calling another Pakistani nigger this, nigger that. Nigger this, nigger that. So many of these hip-hop people in something that I saw and I witnessed on the YouTube, he said that since white people used to use this word as a derogatory term against us, to describe us, that they decided to take the term and to make it something where it's a term of endearment between them. And the Muslim, he comes and he says that this is something that's all right. As a Muslim, it's not something that is acceptable. When you buy into that culture, it's a problem. The culture of gambling, the culture of drinking, the culture of smoking, the culture of trying to be up and hip and slick with the people, that's something that is diametrically opposed to the religion of Al-Islam. Islam is going this way, and those issues are going the other way. They're going the other way. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he made it prohibited for us to use these types of terms. And not only in Islam, if you were to make a joke from this member about the Irish, you're going to get in trouble. If you were to make a joke about the Chinese, you're going to get in trouble. Even with the Jews, if you say that was in the Quran, Allah informed us that the Yahud, they came from, or a group of them were turned into apes and they were turned into swine. It is politically incorrect to say that today. That's in the Quran. But it's better for the imam to avoid that. When we wanted to bring those shiuch over, some of the Muslims 
who want to do the bidding of making things difficult for Islam and the Muslims. They took some of their old speeches in which they made references to what the Quran said about the Yahud being turned, some of them being turned into swines and apes, monkeys. It's politically incorrect to say that. The only people who you can talk bad about in public are people who you want to call them niggas. That's okay. You want to talk about people like that? That's okay. So my point here, Ikhwani, is this ayat of the Quran, it clearly goes to show that these people, they knew how to tap into with this hip-hop culture. They knew how to tap into these particular issues that people go astray on. And some people don't know. Why is the usage of dice impermissible in El Islam? One of the wisdoms that dice are haram and any game where there's dice, whatever the game is, backgammon, there's some game with one dice in it, you press the button and the dice pops around and you move them in around the table. Anything with dice is because it's a game of chance. And Muslims in this religion, we don't believe in chance. Everything is by the qadr of Allah. And as we said so many times, this is one of the reasons why we should not say, you're lucky that this happened, you're lucky that that happened, you're lucky that you didn't come. The Prophet told the people, sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam, la'iba bin nird, faqad asallaha wa rasulahu. Anyone who plays backgammon, he has disobeyed Allah and he has disobeyed his messenger. In another hadith similar to it, he says, Sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam, Man la'iba bin nirdish fa ka'annama ghasama yadayhi fi lahm al-khinzir wa damihi. Anyone who plays any game with dice, it is as if he is submersing and submerging his hand, putting his hand in the meat of a pig and the blood of the pig. In Sahih Muslim, in Sahih Muslim, there is a hadith. This hadith that I mentioned is a Sahih Muslim, but it was translated as anyone who plays chess, then he has disobeyed Allah and his messenger. That's a bad translation. It's talking about backgammon and games of chance, anything dealing with the dice. From the problems that we have in the religion is the fact that intoxicants, ikhwani, as well as drugs, they prevent people from the remembrance of Allah and they prevent people from making the salat. The general remembrance of Allah and from making the salat. As that ayat we mentioned, it clearly illustrated. So the Prophet, as we mentioned earlier, whoever drinks the khamar, he abandons the salat. Now for the person who's getting high, we ask Allah Ta'ala to make it easy that we overcome our habits, these bad habits, and we move on to worshiping him. But look at one of the biggest problems of drinking, smoking, consuming intoxicants, even prescription pills. Someone in your house, they take those pills that cause you to calm down, cause them to calm down. Volume. Hyper. So they have to take volume to calm down. Volume to go to sleep at the end of the day. The kid or someone goes into the bathroom, he finds that prescription and he starts to take it to get high. That's a narcotic that's not halal because it wasn't for you to take it. If it was given to you for a medical reason, that's a different issue. The Prophet told the people, Sallallahu Alaihi wa ala alihi wa sallam, Man sharib al khamr. لم يقبل الله تعالى منه صلاة أربعين يوما. Anyone who drinks alcohol, Allah is not going to accept from him his salat for forty days. And this is from the mu'jizat of Rasulullah صلى الله عليه وسلم. In the last khutbah that we gave here, we talked about the ways that the companions came into Islam. They embraced Islam after thinking and contemplating and studying. They came into Islam. After seeing the Prophet and getting to know his high level of character, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They came into the religion of Al-Islam because like you, they were born into the religion. They came into the deen of Al-Islam based upon the miracles. And we told you about the miracle of the Quran and the miracle of the man who was buried. This hadith is one of his mir many miracles. How did he know over 1400 years ago that the effects of Khamar stays in the body of a person for 40 days. How did he know that? People study the issue now and they find out khamr stays into the body. It has a lingering effect 
inside your veins, inside your central nervous system, inside your tissues for 40 days. As a result of that, your salat is not accepted. So some of our brothers, they decide to stop smoking before Ramadan, a day before Ramadan. Salat is the greatest pillar of Al-Islam after the Shahada. Out of the four pillars of actions, Salat is the greatest one. If the person doesn't pray, then his zakat is missing. His fast is missing. His hajj is missing. Even if he performs the hajj. Even if he fasts. If he's not praying, he has no fast. So if he stops drinking a day before Ramadan, his Salat is not accepted for 40 days after that point. Is that saying that he should stop drinking 40 days before Ramadan? That's not to say that. It goes to show the seriousness of a person taking intoxicants. One intoxicant, when it goes inside of the body, it lasts for all of that time. For those of you who smoke cigarettes, cigarettes are just as bad. Cigarettes, they have over 4,000 chemicals in them. Some of which are toxic, others are not toxic. The chemical nicotine by itself is in your body for four to seven days. Not to mention arsenic, not to mention all of the other stuff. Khamar stays in the body for 40 days. As a result of that, the Prophet Sallallahu he made it the issue that he brought to the attention of the people in this religion. Again, Ikhwani, so that I'll save time and you don't have to ask this particular question. If a person drinks, does that mean he should abandon the salat? No, he still has to pray. But his salat is not accepted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, except if Allah forgives him. So because of this and so many other issues, a number of issues, these are from the issues that were mentioned by the Sheikh Muhammad, Radi, Muhammad Rashid Rada, rahimahullah ta'ala, and there were so many other issues about the legislation of, the prohibition of, al khamr in the religion in the different ways that the ayat and the ahadith mention these issues because of the severity of it and the seriousness of it al-islam has not allowed us to come close to khamr al-islam has not allowed us to deal with khamr in any shape form or fashion he cursed he says sallallahu alaihi wasallam la'an allah al khamr may allah curse the intoxicant may allah curse it and may Allah curse the one who drinks it and the one who pours it. You can't work as a bartender, can't be in a pub, can't pour anyone khamr. You can't drink it and you can't pour it. He says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, And may Allah curse the one who sells the khamr and he purchases it. Someone asked a sheikh, a sadlan who came here, in a book that I found that I had, and I didn't know I had this book before he came, it's a book in which he answered many of the fatwas of the Muslims of America. Someone said to him, in justifying selling khamr in America, they said, if we sell this khamr, it's going to weaken their society. If we sell them the khamr, we don't drink it, but if we sell it, it's going to create all of these problems in their society. Enmity, it's going to be stress on their NHS, stress in the prisons and so forth and so on the infrastructure is going to suffer so based upon that are we justified to sell khamar there's no justification in selling khamar absolutely no justification in the deen absolutely none the prophet cursed and asked allah and his dua is mustajab he made dua to allah to curse the one who sells the khamar and the one who purchases the khamar in the same hadith, he said, Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, wa Allah asiraha wa mu'tasiraha. May Allah curse the one who squeezes it or he steps on it. All he's doing is helping them to make the khamr. He doesn't drink it himself. His job is that he works in the vineyards of Italy or other than that in France, in America, and he's just stepping on the grace to make the wine. He's cursed as well as the one is, who is being squeezed for. And lastly, he said, Sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam Wa la'na Allah hamilaha Wal mahmulata ilayhi Wa akila Thamaniha And may Allah curse the one who carries the khamar And the one who is carried too 
So the Muslim, he can't have a job, ikhwani, where he works for the Heineken company, for an example, and he transports the Heineken beer from here to there. And may Allah curse the one who takes the price of the khamr. Which brings me to this issue, and that is some of us, we work at Tesco's, and we work at other supermarkets and restaurants where khamr and issues like this are secondary. They're not the primary issue of what that store is selling. The sheikh, as I mentioned, the Sadlan, he was put, this question was put forth to him. What about the people who work in supermarkets that sell khamr and khinzir, but especially khamr? Can the person keep that job? He said, I'm not going to tell anyone to stop his job because those issues are secondary. If he can, he should try not to sell it himself. If it comes to him, he should try not to stock it, not to carry it, not to bag it, not to help anyone win it with it. If he can do that, he should do that. He said, but I don't see it as being something that's impermissible. But if he got another job, then this is something that is better for him, especially in light of the fact that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam made dua to Allah Azza wa to curse the people who this is the situation. And there's another hadith where he said, may Allah curse the table that khamr is being consumed on. So if there is a restaurant that we like, like Nando's, we worry, is the Nando's halal? Is it halal or haram? The Nando's is halal. They said it's halal, but they sell khamr. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa he didn't like for the people to sit at the table where the khamr was being served or in the place where the munkar or the evil was taking place. All of those issues are issues that show us, khwani, the severity and the seriousness of the khamr in the religion of al-Islam. And it's something that should be avoided. If a person has some ongoing struggles and issues with khamr or drugs, there's always help. Allah Ta'ala forgives all sins, even if the person is drinking khamr and he makes tawbah to Allah with sincerity, Allah Ta'ala will forgive him. Man sharib al-khamr fi dunya Anyone who drinks the khamr in this dunya, he won't be able to drink it in the hereafter. Meaning, he won't go to Jannah because he won't go to Jannah right away. He has to go to the hellfire. Because inside of the Jannah, there is khamr. But the khamr of the Jannah is different from the khamr of the dunya. It doesn't get you drunk. It tastes a certain way. Has a different texture. So the dunya is a prison for the believer and it is the paradise for the kafir because in the dunya he does what he wants to do he drinks what he wants to drink and he wears what he wants to wear gold other than that he does what he wants to do in the dunya but in the hereafter these things are exclusively and wholly for the people who were patient and they abandoned them in the dunya whoever drinks the khamr one of the punishments in the hellfire is that the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said that they will be made to drink the sweat that becomes hot from the disbelieving evildoers of the hellfire. So you can refer back to the major books in Al-Islam, all of the books of Hadith, without any exception. There's the chapter of Al-Ashriba, the chapter of drinks, khamr is in all of the books of Hadith. All of the books of Fiqh deal with the issue of Al-Khamr. You can refer back to these issues. Riyadh al-Saliheen, the book of prohibitions, the book of the seriousness and the severity of drink and khamr. All of these books, we find that the scholars of Al-Islam mentioned them in a way of giving us advice. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept our struggles and our jihad and help us to avoid being the people who fall into the issue of consuming alcohol and narcotics. And also may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help those people who have this problem and make it easy for them. He is a'la and a'lam. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم